How do we motivate children to become, to love to learn? And if you motivate them to love to learn, they become lifelong learners because it's so much fun. They'll keep doing it outside the classroom walls and outside the classroom hours forever. Welcome to Learning Unboxed, a conversation about teaching, learning, and the future of work. This is Annalise Corbin, Chief Goddess of the Past Foundation and your host. We hear frequently that the global education system is broken. In fact, we spend billions of dollars trying to fix something that's actually not broken at all, but rather irrelevant. It's obsolete. A hundred years ago, it functioned fine. So let's talk about how we reimagine, rethink, and redesign our educational system. So today's episode of Learning Unbox, we have a very exciting conversation. We are going to talk to a amazing author, a research scientist, an advocate around the world, uh, and joining us to talk about sort of her work and the influence and her thinking um, about the world and the future of education is Arana Dejani. And so we're super excited to have, have her join us. So welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. I am excited to learn and share at the same time. Excellent. And, you know, just to set some context for our listeners, you know, it is really, really tough to sort of do a bio for you because quite frankly, for everybody listening, you know, Rana's experience, the things she's done is just absolutely amazing. So she has a PhD in molecular cell biology. She has received more accolades and recognitions um, from around the world than than many people we get the the opportunity to talk to, including Fulbright um, Fellow. She has um, participated in the Clinton Global Initiative. She is on a Fulbright Visiting Scholar Program from Jordan to the United States, you know, and just on and on and on. She is also, um, and one of the things I'm really excited to talk about, um, the author of the book, Five Scarves, Doing the Impossible. If we can reverse cell fate, why can't we redefine success? And if you've not looked at Five Scarves or encountered it, I highly recommend every woman and educator around the, the globe should take a look. And we're going to dig in here in a moment and talk about five scarves, but just to sort of give a little bit of a high level explanation, this volume is an exploration of the intersections between gender, race, religion, and science told through the eyes of one of the world's leading Muslim women scientists, Dr. Dijani. And and she's the professor, as we said, of molecular biology, and she is really seeking a paradigm shift in the fight against women's oppression. And so with that, Rana, share with us a little bit about the sort of why. What is your big 100,000 foot view calling into the world that says, hey, this is the space I need to occupy and the work I need to do? Uh, well, that's a, that's not an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it really boils down to see, seeing inside ourselves on what is it that makes us up every morning and, uh, and what is it that we're excited about. Uh, that gives us um, the spice in our life, that keeps us moving, that motivates us. And and to me, uh, the the feeling is that if I have anything, I want to share it with humanity and I want to also learn from the people around me uh, and and the wonderful uh, nature and universe around me. And, And I think that excitement never ends. It's like you're on a roller coaster uh, to the last day of your life with this uh, magical uh, curiosity driving you and the opportunity in front of you that you're seeking that you know is going to give you even a better experience, uh, whatever it is. But even negative things are not negative. They are just opportunities that you've uh, that are learning experiences that you take with you and move on as you go forward. Yeah, and what a, what a beautiful space to occupy it, right? Just to sort of wrestle with, you know, this notion of getting folks to to embrace being a lifelong learner, right? And the joy that you, like, as you indicate, the joy that can potentially come from that. If you say the world is an amazing place and there is something that I can learn every day and there there is something that I can teach others every day and every moment as well. That's That's a really remarkable sort of space or outlook, if you will. So help us understand, tie that back into why write this book? Yeah. So why, uh, why was it necessary for you? So I think I, the, the, it, now retrospectively, I urge everybody to write their story because yeah. everybody has some a unique experience uh, that uh, they owe it to the world to share, uh, to inspire, 
to learn from. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, having said that now, when I first said, I wasn't thinking of writing a book at all. I, I was just being the scientist, you know, the one who mm-hmm. does things and embraces things as I go. But then I realized that sometimes our voices are not heard or they're heard in a particular way. And so we don't, mm-hmm. we don't have the, the chance uh, to give a, a fair um, explanation of who we are and what we think about. And, and because our life is short, however long we live, and there's a limited number of encounters we can have, one way uh, to, to keep that for future generations and to reach out to other people around the world uh, of a legacy is to write. Because the written mm-hmm. word stays beyond, you know, it, it transcends. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I felt it, it was a, a duty, uh, especially with globalization, domination mm-hmm. of particular cultures, and the underlying of, of particular voices and cultures that the, we have to say and tell our story. Because if we don't, somebody else will tell our story. And we can't blame exactly. them. Exactly. Right? Right. Uh, so, right. So we owe it. And that's kind of the precedent why I, I wrote my story. And, mm-hmm. and, and now I, it, it, it's so um, enriching. Because you learn right. from it and you learn yeah. from the feedback of your readers that I, I'm actually writing two other books at this at this moment to share. And this is just a shout out. You don't have to be specialized or expert. Right. Just write, right. write from your heart. Right. Absolutely right from your heart. And tell your story because there is, in fact, so much value in that. And I love the premise that if you don't tell your story, somebody else will. You know, I, I, I as an anthropologist, I spend... Well, the majority of my career, right, thinking about and trying to understand the ins and outs of humanity. And I, people ask me all the time, you know, what is that thing, anthropologist? And I said, oh, well, we're the scientists of humanity, right? We, we, we are the ones studying what makes, what, what is the humanness of being a human, right? And so story is critical to that and, and understanding and respecting other cultures. And so I think it's really intriguing. And I think part of what really appealed to me so much about your work is the fact that you did that very same thing and yet you ran at it. And this is the thing that I love. So I wanted to get into the weeds of this just a little bit for our listeners. You ran at it from the, the molecular biology, that scientific hat, that world that you've lived and trained in. And you said, hey, what if we approach this very same conversation, which quite frankly, at the end of the day is really about culture, but we're going to do it from a different perspective. And oh, by the way, along the way, I'm going to help the world um, come with me on my journey into saying, hey, we need to do something about some of the gender inequities that are so prevalent on our planet. So talk to us a little bit about the sort of the premise, the approach that you took for folks that haven't, haven't had a chance to go out and grab and read and digest that book. But I'm hoping by the time we finish, everybody runs out to buy a copy. <laughs> I hope so too. Actually, the premise comes from, as you mentioned, from science, mm-hmm. uh, which to me equals nature. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing is, uh, we have our beliefs and our belief systems and our perceptions of what we see around us. And you as an anthropologist would know a lot more than me on human relationships and concepts. But these are very transient and they are they depend on different humans with different perspectives. I could have my own perspective and you could see the same thing but have a totally different perspective. So who do I trust? How do I know how to go forward? And so to me, it's about using nature around me, observing it, trying to understand it, using my mind and my brain, which is part of nature, mm-hmm. and applying the scientific method of analysis gives me something I can hold on to. Now, even having said that, that doesn't mean the science I discover is set in stone. Actually, the hallmark of any scientist or, and by the way, by, of any human being yeah. who, will, who is successful, meaning survives, is being <laughs> curious and being critical at every uh, intersection. So yes, today I make an observation and I come up with a conclusion and discover a theory, but that's that tomorrow somebody else with a new tools or because they are different from me, they can see something new. But, uh, uh, you know, using that same framework kind mm-hmm. of gives some kind of continuity uh, of being curious, using your mind and logic as we unfold and, un- and discover things as we go. So to me, using that as, as the approach, which usually people don't, I tackled the issue of gender and women and how they are perceived in their workplace. Uh, their percentages of the workplace and and asking mm-hmm. those fundamental questions and even challenging the questions themselves. Because right. one thing I say in my work is we keep repeating the same question. How can we get more women in the workplace? How can we push women forward? And it's all about how can we do this to women? And nobody asked women what they really right. want. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> which, which I draw from science. If you keep asking the same question and you're hitting a wall, 
It means you're asking the wrong question. Wrong question. Yeah, absolutely. No question whatsoever. And so um, so share with us then. So there are five scarves, um, as the title indicates, and each one of these scarves metaphorically represents a tenant that is very important to you in the way that you're thinking about your work in the world. And so just very, very high level, give us an overview of the five scarves. Yeah. And then we're going to dig into one of those in particular. Yeah. So the first one, and as always, the, the one I'm most proud of is I'm a mother, right? That's fundamentally mm-hmm. human. And, yeah. and, and, and the most important thing that we can do for our species. The second is I'm an educator, a teacher, whether as a school mm-hmm. teacher and then as a university. And actually, we're all teachers because we're always, yeah. you know, sharing what we know. The third one is a, I'm a scientist. I work in molecular biology, looking at ethnic mm-hmm. populations and genetics and epigenetics, how the environment mm-hmm. affects us. And then my fourth is being a social entrepreneur, founding uh, the program We Love Reading, changing mindsets through reading to create change makers. And the last one is, uh, is you know, uh, defending a woman's rights uh, to find her place in the world uh, mm-hmm. rightfully. Uh, and and being respected uh, and leading uh, from that premise going forward. But that's a whole yeah. story that you have to read the book to, to learn. Oh, absolutely. We're not going to go in, in, into a lot of those weeds. But again, I do encourage folks who are listening, if you've not seen this, it's you, you, please do go um, grab a copy of it, dig in, because there's a lot to learn from it. And I think the other piece is a lot to inspire you to not stop, to not stop your own journey, right? To just to to roll up your sleeves and say, I am part of the global narrative um, and that every single individual has a contribution to make within that narrative. So I really appreciate that um, about the work. But I want to dig into one of those scars in particular. We love reading. Right. And so because I think that that for the, for the listeners um, on Learning Unbox, that's going to cross so many um, different uh, principles that we utilize and, and are thinking about the why of this program and the value of spending time talking about those positive disruptions in education, because there's a lot of conversation rightfully and sometimes wrongly um, about the dysfunction or the fact that our global education system is actually not serving humanity today, right, Um, in the ways that it should. And there are many, many examples out there in the world of how that's changing or that's not actually the case, but there are really amazing things that are happening. And if we could harness, if we could powerfully go out and grab a hold of all of those really super examples of the great things that are happening, pull them all together when it makes sense and actually launch something new. That's the entrepreneur um, component of all of it. That It might truly make a difference in the world. And so let's talk about We Love Reading and sort of the premise and what it is that you're doing with that and how it functions. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more about the positive disruption and the hope mm-hmm. and optimism mm-hmm. that if we really trust our gut feeling and uh, uh, that we can make a difference. Uh, so we love reading. I, I mean, first of all, the, the name itself is an act, action verb, mm-hmm. right? And it's about mm-hmm. a collective we and then love and then reading uh, continuously. Uh, uh, what, it, what, it, what it aims to do is to build, I like to call it education resilience, a mm-hmm. lifelong learner. Uh, because what it does, it, it focuses on fostering motivation to want to learn because you want to, not because you have to. And I think that's right. the fundamental thing. In education systems we see today, they put the cart before the horse, meaning mm-hmm. they put all the curricula, the teacher training, but they forget that the, the student, the child or the adult or the human being, if they're not motivated, nothing is going to make them do go and learn. And if they exactly. are dragged because of a school system, <laughs> well, they're out of school by 18. And now yeah, with the right. internet, nobody's even going to school or with COVID. Yeah. So yeah. Well, what is it in it? So, so I think that's the first premise is how do we motivate children to become, to love to learn? And if you motivate them to love to learn, they become lifelong learners because it's so much fun. They'll keep doing it outside the classroom walls and outside the classroom hours forever. And why does this become so important in addition to the motivation and inspiration is that the world is changing and changing at a very fast pace. And we don't know what the, our children growing up are growing up into a world that we don't even know what it's going to look like. So the only thing we can do is to equip them with the tools and the skills uh, uh, to, to be independent learners, lifelong learners. And, and the only way we can do it is by this motivation. So how does this tie into my program? What we've discovered is that to motivate somebody to learn, 
starts with motivating somebody to want to read for fun. Because reading leads to learning. That's the only way we access, right? It's about you read something, you follow up with it. Even if you're apprenticing with somebody, learning from somebody, ultimately you have to go back and read because of the uh, of the, the wealth of information, richness that you have from the past and you have across the world from different uh, resources. You have to read. And to read means to be patient. To read means to be curious. Uh, to read means to have to be persistent. Uh, and, and, and how do you how do you make a child do all of that? It has to come from within them. And so it, that's where the other part, which is reading for fun, not just reading for the sake of reading or to unlock, you know, how to connect letters together. It's about reading for fun, something that you you can't wait to do under the covers. You're begging somebody, mm-hmm. that, that <laughs> thing. And that thing mm-hmm. only starts very early. It's a, mm-hmm. and The older you get, the more difficult it is to plant that because it has to do with your, your brain and the neural networks and how mm-hmm. they, as they connect, there becomes an association between the feeling of security, love, and happiness when somebody is reading with you. Because you don't read for fun. It doesn't happen by itself. Again, it's back to the we. It's a community thing. It's about a caregiver, a parent who cuddles up with a child and reads yeah. aloud and shares that joy. That's mm-hmm. where that motiv- that pleasure becomes uh, entrenched. And that's where that motivation starts blooming. And the child becomes the driver of learning and 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 uh, and seeking opportunities to learn regardless of the circumstances around them and that is the world that our children are going to go into and we need to have them prepared so that's the premise of wheel of reading on one hand for the children now wheel of reading has another impact so that's the child there's the adult because what we do is we train youth and adults to read aloud to the children so that we can plant that education resilience that motivation but what we discovered is that this adult who's reading aloud to the kids in their native language, in a public space where they run this reading aloud session and own it and have the freedom to quit whenever they want because they're volunteering and they're doing it for their own good, they discover their inner potential and they become change makers in their own right. So actually, it's they discover their voices literally as they read aloud to the kids and they discover their voices figuratively. Uh, by be- discovering their own potential, saying, if I can gather kids and read aloud to them and change them, what else can I change in my community? And I think that second thing is very important in learning and growing and, distru- and positive disruption, because most of the time, all programs that are rolled out, whether to do, to underserved communities in the majority or even those communities mm-hmm. who are more mm-hmm. served, it's all about somebody giving something something to someone else. It's about service. It's about, right. I know you don't know. I'm going to teach you. And that right. is, that's a very negative approach. The approach is mm-hmm. you trust people and they know better what's good for them. And they just need that push, that, that encouragement to realize how and have that self-confidence. And then they, they're just going to bloom and they will mm-hmm. solve their problems. They don't know, need you or a government to come in and solve it. They'll ask your help, but they don't need you to lead it. And that's, uh, uh, and therefore has sustainability built into it to continue making a difference. So just in a nutshell, it's changing the minds. That's why we say change. We, we love reading is about changing mindsets through Mindset. reading mm-hmm. to create change makers. Yeah. And no question that that's going to be one of those long-term positive side effects of that type of experience. I'm curious about sort of how this program scaffolds, and maybe I'm not using the correct word, so please help me out if that's the case. But I mean, one of the things, for example, that, that I see frequently with literacy programs, and there are a lot of them, as you are well aware, uh, you know, all around the world. And to your point, a lot of them are all around the, the adult, whoever is delivering the content is the expert. And what I know from, you know, many years at past is, you know, I, I think that we learn as much, if not more, every single day from the time that we spent immersed with kids, with children, right, then goes the other direction, right? And so given that, one of the things that I'm really curious about, because, you know, volunteer literacy programs, and I'm using that term very loosely, but volunteer literacy programs oftentimes struggle with getting volunteers and mentors because the adults 
struggle with literacy themselves, often in the spaces and the places where we most desperately need the influence and impact of these types of programs. So how do you manage that disconnect if if in case that's really what you see. And I think for our listeners, because one of the things we didn't really sort of set very much is you didn't necessarily grow up in the U.S., but you've worked all over the world. So I would assume that, you know, whichever hat you had on at any given moment, you've seen some of these same scenarios. So I'm really curious about that adult piece, that mentorship and that that learning opportunity that comes on that flip side um, how do you how do you help folks that might themselves be skills or confidence deficient step into that space? That's a very important question and fundamental to what we do at We Love Reading. Uh, and and it's we call it our actually our secret sauce. It's our magic, right? <laughs> and we only you know we we were doing it without noticing. And that's the beauty when you do something organically and naturally. And, and but it was noticed by others, right? UNESCO, when I was telling them the story of We Love Reading, they told me, but Anna, your program is all about inspiring adults. And I said, really? I never thought of it that way. You know, I was just thinking of the kids. So point on with your question. So what we discovered, uh, our secret sauce, is that uh, we, when we invite youth and adults, and that's why we say 16 to 100 years old to come and join, uh, we invite them to come and join. First of all, they're free to join if they want, and they're free to quit the power of having the freedom to quit cannot be underestimated. Uh, Because most programs are all about, you know, you got to do this with me. There's a signing contract. You have to abide by the rules. It's like, what? Why should I do that for you? You know, what are you? And you're not even paying me, right? So what's the deal? (laughs) Or if you want to pay them, then it becomes not unsustainable because you can't keep up that money flowing uh, or you're competing with someone else. So it's all wrong. Uh, And so what we, we, we say, this is up to you. If you want to do it, you're welcome. And, and you're doing it for yourself. You're not doing it for us. And you can quit. So what we do is the training is about holding hands and going on a journey uh, uh, where it's a very interactive training where the, the person who's in the journey d- discovers questions and tr- attempts to answer them from their own experience. So it's more about them discovering themselves understanding their own community environment, maybe and peer-to-peer learning from others, what do they say? How does their opinion compare to the rest of the group? Rather than being uh, you know, receivers of information from, uh, from somebody up there. So it's not, guide on, you know, it's not a sage on the stage. It's about a guide on the side, a facilitator. But in the end, they are leading the discussion and they are guiding the discussion. And they are contributing to actually the training uh, by sharing their opinions and their answers about their own selves and their own uh, communities that are incorporated into the next training for someone else. So they see the names of people before them and they know that they will be part of the training for the future generation. So this instills in them this feeling of, I am important. I count, my opinion counts. And I am the expert for my community. No one else is more expert than me. Because in the end, and the training goes about how, why, why do they think reading is important? Uh, how, why don't children read from their own perspective? And then ultimately, we we all come to the conclusion it's about you know the motivation and the fun. And they train how to read aloud as an art. And again, they're reading children's books in their native language, so they don't have to be skilled. They don't have to be educated. They don't even have to know how to read because it's a children's books with a lot of st- pictures. So you actually make it up, and that's okay. Um, but ultimately. It's in the end, we tell them, okay, so now you're going to read aloud to the kids in your neighborhood. You know the best place. You know where the kids come. You know when to bring them. You know how to get to them. We don't know anything. We want to learn from you. And so they, they become the leaders. And then we have a session about fears and hopes. Like, what, what, what do you fear to go and do this in your community? We, we don't answer that question. It's the group, the peer-to-peer who help each other. And so one woman will tell the other, wait, what are you scared of? Oh, for example, if the community is going to accept, she tells her, ah, oh, forget about it. I'll tell you what to do. And, and so, and so they, <laughs> they help each other. What are their fears? What are their hopes? And, and so this peer-to-peer is so important in that learning journey. And when they end, uh, they go home with a bag of books, uh, but that's it. They're, they're set free in the sense that they can do whatever they want with it. Uh, uh, they can take the books. They don't want to take the books. They can do whatever they want. 
And, and the other part of the magical sauce is that when we fall, we don't follow up with them in a, in a, our approach is not that they report to us or, or that we measure them or that we, you know, no, 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 or evaluate. No, no, we reach out and say, could you share with us your stories, your successes? I mean, you're our heroes. You're our celebrities. We want to showcase you. You, you know, you are the ones um, uh, th- that we are so proud to be part of, of your work. And so they share with us their stories. And that's why we changed the paradigm on how we measure success, which actually leads to how do you measure achievement in education? It's not the grades and the questions because people are very diverse. It's about sharing stories of what you've achieved yourself because those sharings are sustainable. Those impacts are sustainable because they're real. They're not just numbers on a paper. They're not just how many good books given out and how many people attended a training. And that's why when international NGOs uh, approached us, they wanted to implement our program within their uh, geographical location. They questioned, they said, oh, you're not paying people? And we said, no. They said, oh, you're going to fail. We just smiled and we said, you'll see. And of course, uh, after we, they, uh, they ruled out the program, five years later, our volunteers, the We Love Reading ambassadors, are still doing it. While other programs, everybody just, you know, checked out. That was it. Finished the project. Everybody went home. So this sustainability is our secret sauce that uh, hopefully answers your question, but it really harks into our evolution as a species that we need, we, uh, that we need to feel that we are important and, and to acknowledge that in ourselves, our self-awareness, our self-acceptance that builds and boosts our confidence that is reinforced by the children first and then by the community, because everybody starts looking up to our ambassador as a leader. If she's a woman, if she's a, uh, or he's a grandfather or, or a young youth that, wow, look, look at what they're doing. And it's so simple. It's just about reading aloud to kids in your native language. But because of that simplicity, uh, which actually, uh, it took me three years of developing the program in my neighborhood. I was actually doing it in my neighborhood. And for those three years, as I was doing it trial and error, uh, of course, now I realized uh, uh, that it's, it's called human centered design. And I yeah. said, oh, really? I, I mean, I was just doing what I thought was the right thing to do. Right. And then now as a biologist, I call it, no, you know, that was all natural evolution. You know, it's mm-hmm. like for survival of the fittest until I boiled it down to the simplest formula or, or the most empirical formula where it still works with the least input. And because of that, it, it, it has spread all over the world. So now 62 countries, because it's based on shared universal values. That's just a basic skeleton of a framework that any that's so flexible that you tailor it to your own culture, your own context, wherever and whoever you are. Well, and I would actually argue that that's I I, I would pin that actually as the secret sauce. I, I understand your perspective on the secret sauce, but stepping back and sort of looking at it, you know, fifty thousand foot view, it seems to me that you know part of the secret sauce is the fact that you very purposefully understand human culture and that you understand the interconnectedness between the the sort of living and world and life experiences of a given community, a neighborhood, however you want to place it, right? But that that thing is living and breathing. And by recognizing that it's living and breathing and it might not be exactly like the, the community, the neighborhood right next door, and that you don't treat them you know, as absolutely the same, even though they may be in the same state, the same country, the same, you know, ethnic group. None of that matters because the reality is, as you well know, the success is at that very nascent ground neighborhood level, right? Those individuals that then others will flock to and will learn from and, you know, back to the point of, you know, in in, in the native language, you can make the story up, that all of that's okay. It's about that human connection. You in fact, start with that human-centric design perspective, but I think that the success is probably the fact that you recognize that it has to be at a very individualized, local, community-based level to be successful because human culture trumps so many things. We, we see it every day, right? We see it in politics. We see it in evolution. We see it in so many different places. Um, so I, I want to dig into two, two things. Um, so I really want to ask you, what were, what were some of the aha moments? Because I have no doubt in your journey um, around We Love Reading that you have learned some very profound things. 
from the participants. And so I'm really curious, you know, are, is there a moment or two that were such ahas that you were like, oh my gosh, I didn't expect this, or I'm so thrilled to have found it? Well, I love your questions because I'm learning so much. <laughs> 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 because you're asking me to reflect and that doesn't always happen in that way. So yeah. thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I like your, your my. So now I have two spices. I have two secret yeah. spices. So thank you for pointing <laughs> that one out. <laughs> um, all right. So my aha moments. Uh, and I'm just thinking on the spot now. This is not yeah, as a yeah. result of any... This is a conversation. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you'll think of others later, but just like on the fly, there's, there's bound to be something. And I, I think there's a lot of value in those curiosity things that just really stuck with you. Yeah, I think one fundamental one that keeps hitting me every time is that this works. You know, mm-hmm. it's just as simple as that. Because, you know, sometimes one doubts oneself. Yeah. And, and you know, I think humans, uh, if you can imagine something, then it's possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's the, that's the power. That's the power mm-hmm. of human, human imagination. But sometimes you doubt your dream and you think, Could it, maybe it's just in my head. But then mm-hmm. I meet these amazing women and how when, and they share with me their stories of, of how they've changed and how they've discovered their self. And you see it in their eyes and the way they speak and, and how their life has transformed. And you say, oh, my God, this really works. And to, to me, it, it gives me goosebumps when I think of it is that so imagine every one of us, if we had a dream that we believed in and, and actually went out and did it, mm-hmm. uh, how the, world, the whole world would change. It's as simple as that. You know, sometimes you think, could it be that simple? Yes, yeah. it can be that simple. So that's one of my really aha moments that actually keeps repeating itself every time. Yeah. <laughs> so that's I love that. That was beautiful. Same same question, flip side, right? So what have what has been the greatest difficulty or a constraint that you've bumped up against on this journey that, again, you were surprised by? I, you know, you're an optimist. I can tell you are a perpetual optimist. So, so given that, you know, you're going to go out there and conquer the world. But I have no doubt there were walls that you hit. Um, so share with us one or two of those that, you know, same sort of thing. It was profound. Yeah, thank you. Uh, First of all, about the optimist, my husband says, I see an ocean in a drop of water. So (laughs) I love that. (laughs) That's his uh, quote always. Um, Yeah. So even when people ask me that question, I think, wait a minute, I don't remember being in an 80 challenge. And I think, no, 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 you have to think about it in a different way. Because like I said, every challenge to me Mm -hmm. is an opportunity to learn. But but I've learned to flip the question in my mind so I can answer you. So I think one of the the challenges that I faced is... uh, all right, so I started off, I want to, you know, do something good myself. Because if I'm not going to do it, I would feel responsible for the children around me because I mm-hmm. discovered the solution, right? But then uh, as I progressed from this idea as a social entrepreneur to become an organization, a nonprofit, and, and spreading around the world, unconsciously, I slipped into that mentality because of all the people around you, the mentors, the funders, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. the international community. I was like, how are you getting your money? Uh, what are you doing? And of course, you, you write, uh, and maybe I'll just focus on one, which is the funding. You, you write nine grants and you get one of them and, and you become right. so uh, caught up in the, uh, these, uh, these bureaucratic, let's say, business kind of things that sometimes you forget what it was this all about. Right. And I think uh, uh, that to me, that was a challenge that I faced because it happened without me noticing. And then suddenly I woke mm-hmm. up and I woke up mm-hmm. because we were offering, we were trying to think of different ways. So we, we offer the program for free for individuals. This has always been our case. And, mm-hmm. but it was always a tension because people tell us, no, you got to pay money. You know, wh- what's right. your, wh- what's the, the, all the question that every investor talks about, like, what's your value proposition? What is the yeah. money? What, how do you make money? I said, why are you right. worried about that? Right. Mm-hmm. We have a great program. So so, so I always insisted the program is free for individuals. This is not about gathering money because right. nobody can afford $2 to pay for something. They either do it right. because they want to or they don't. And, and, and that's mm-hmm. it. But, but then becomes, so I thought, okay, we will partner with international NGOs and they would pay us a fee to use our program, kind of like a licensing fee. Yeah. Right? And yeah. they already have a lot of money and this is just a little bit more. Um, but then, and that was fine. I, I, that's okay. It's like Robin Hood. You know, you take from the rich yeah, and you give to yeah. the poor. But then I, I got these smaller organizations coming to me and saying, can we use the program? And I started along the same thing. Okay, you have to pay for it. Or then I thought, okay, well, we'll do a sliding fee. And then I think, oh my God, Rana, wait a minute. It's not about the money. It's not about 
even surviving as an organization. It's about letting it go. And don't worry, if you let go, everything will happen. So it's about mm -hmm. shifting where I perceived myself in the, in the universe uh, to another and present. And suddenly, because I shifted, I saw mm -hmm. a whole new world of opportunity. So if you want to call that, I hit a wall because I was following the status quo. And then I realized that, that the whole framework of how work is done in, in uh, not just in the nonprofit, I, I think the whole world is wrong, even yeah. education, right? It's all yeah. set on a premise of uh, capitalism, of, of not acknowledging the individuality, not trusting people uh, to mm -hmm. figure out things for themselves. I think that's very important, trust and respect for people to figure out things uh, for themselves and, and acknowledging the diversity and beauty uh, and celebrating uh, the beauty and diversity of humanity, which is fundamentally biology and evolution. Mm -hmm. Without mm -hmm. the diversity, Absolutely. we would not yeah. survive. It's yeah. core, yet we don't use it. And right. so to me, what I what happened is, and, and this realization, you know, was kind of stewing and it really reached uh, you know, fruitation or whatever during COVID because mm -hmm. when, when, yeah. I was alone and, you know, you, you took a step back. We all took this kind of global mm -hmm. step back of reassessing everything. And I felt suddenly liberated, free, mm -hmm. because I, I was mm -hmm. not hooked to I need to get funding or I need yeah. to push this forward. I let go of the whole program for free now. Every, anybody can take it. And I'm reaching out to people. It's like, take it and let me help mm -hmm. you yeah. make a difference. So it's just a shifting of perspective that allowed me to change that challenge, uh, which in some cases could be looked as something negative. Mm -hmm. And by flipping the question and letting it all go, and now it became a positive. And you can't imagine the number of partners we found who want to work with us uh, and take the program and run with it uh, because of this shift in, 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 in perspective. And that's a, it's a beautiful thing, right? To, and it's freeing, you know, as, as you, you indicated, right? Suddenly you, you feel free to go out and do the great work that you always envisioned um, doing. And I, I, I can totally understand and identify with that. I mean, I, I, I have been um, running this organization for 20 some odd years and same sort of iterations around nonprofit. And as a research scientist, not, not really having a clue, how does the world of business and industry and nonprofit work? And well, what do you mean I can't do X, Y, or Z? Or what, what do you, you know? And, and so I do understand the sort of push and pull and the tug. And I would agree, I would say for me, same, similar sort of experience that, you know, for better or worse, there was an awful lot of horrible things tied to this global pandemic, but there was an, a moment of pause. The world did in fact have the opportunity to take a, 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 a giant and sometimes uh, step back, maybe just a small one, but we, we were all forced to take a moment. And there is value in a moment sometimes, right? That I think is often um, not fully um, understood or actualized. So I appreciate that. I always like to close the program by recognizing that there are people out there in the world who have spent the half hour listening to us have this wonderful conversation. And, you know, they step back and, and reflect on what they heard and want to do what you do, or they want to tap into the program that you've developed. So how, how, how does the world go about becoming one with the work that you're doing? Great. That's a great question. I, I just want to highlight what you said about COVID. I see the silver lining in what happened mm -hmm. and what we're going through. And I think if one thing we take home from that is that the impossible is possible. All the excuses that everyone or every organization or government or system had put forward has proven that it, it can change. And to me, this is an opportunity. That's the silver lining that we can change. And it's all about system change. And it's so finding those pivotal points that root causes. If you change those, you change the whole system and have the guts and the confidence and the courage to do that and find people like you who can work with you. So for yeah. us, <laughs> at We Love Reading, uh, we ask you first to start by reading. Every day, <laughs> remember to read, even if it's for 10 minutes. And then read for yourself, read for the people around you, the children around you, but always have a book in your bag that you can read. Second, for We Love Reading, uh, if you want to join us, you could uh, join us as a We Love Reading ambassador, take our training. The training is online in 10 languages now. And if you have a language that's not there, just help us translate it and then we can add it. And then if you want to help us in terms of volunteering in the, in the work itself, not just the reading aloud to the kids. So if you have some talent in IT or talent in, in, in research or talent in writing, 
uh, we invite you to join us and help us. And we do a lot of research, by the way, on We Love Reading. So we don't just depend on the stories, but we do the deep dives to prove our points with, with researchers as well. And lastly, if you want to uh, just share your thoughts, share what you think, so we can incorporate that in, in, in the philosophy and the thinking. And by the way, we have a new book about We Love Reading, an introduction that's on our website that you can uh, buy and read and share uh, going forward as well. So we're always open to ideas, thoughts, and reflections. And remember uh, that each one of you it counts. You know, your DNA is different from every other human being. Nobody has the same DNA. Who has ever lived will ever come in the future or lives today. And so you have a unique thing that you can give to the world. So find something that you that you want to change and go ahead and change it. And it's all about the little steps. That's the butterfly effect. You know, when a butterfly flutters its wings, it moves the, wind, the air a centimeter. There's a change in time and space beyond what you can imagine. But it all starts with those small things. So have, so have confidence, dream big, trust yourself, and, and be the change. Absolutely, absolutely. Tap into your passion and take it to the world. So I love that very much. So thank you so much for joining us today, spending time, uh, letting us be part of your journey and sharing your story with us. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. Likewise. Thank you for joining us for Learning Unboxed, a conversation about teaching, learning, and the future of work. I want to thank my guests and encourage you all to be part of the conversation. Meet me on social media at Annalise Corbin and join me next time as we stand up, step back, and lean in to reimagine education.